You're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. Uh, my name is Alan. And I'm Sarah. You can be heard on CHMA 106.9 in Sackville, New Brunswick. CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, Nova Scotia. On Apple Podcasts. And you can see a video version of this on YouTube. And it's the very beginning of May as we record this, which is pretty exciting because uh, there's no more kicking the can down the road. It's definitely spring and lots of spring things are happening. So one thing that's happening at the community garden this week is a plant swap and sale. So that's going to be a really awesome garden event happening in Sackville. And we're going to have some vendors there. And then also people are encouraged to just bring different perennial plants and plants that they have that are extra from their gardens. And then we'll uh, do a big old trade. So if you're in Sackville, New Brunswick or the area, come by on Sunday, May 5th from 10 to 1. And share your perennials. And what is a perennial? Right. So a perennial is a type of plant that lives for more than one year, as opposed to an annual, which just lives for one year, or a biennial that lives for two years. Are so, there triannuals? No, I don't think so. They would be called short-lived perennials, I would say. Okay. So uh, perennials, there's a perennial swap and sale, and now is the time of year when people dig up, split, and share their perennials. So do you want to walk us through sort of some of the concepts around perennials and how we maintain them, move them, and deal with them at this time of year? I really like doing this kind of work in spring because it's before you get too busy with all the annual vegetable gardening, and uh, you can really see where all your perennials are. They're coming up in your garden, uh, and they're putting out new leaves, and you can uh, start to recognize just who's in what area. Uh, a lot of things will have spread since last year. That's the great thing about perennials is once you plant them, they just keep going, so you end up with more every year. Um, so it's a great time to poke around and see what's there and try and imagine what your garden's going to look like in the future. So it's like a good garden planning uh, time of year. So if you are, you know, you've got a perennial area of your garden, maybe you inherited the garden or um, you're not really sure where you planted uh, how would you like identify things at this time of year? Yeah, it's a good one. A lot of friends will send me photos sometimes saying like, what is this? What is this? Or you see that a lot on Facebook uh, garden groups. So I would say you can tell it's a perennial and not a weed often by where it's placed. Like a weed you'll sort of find in all kinds of different different locations, whereas a perennial will usually be like one or a few bigger clumps of something that looks the same. And how to tell what it is, uh, you can use different garden apps like iNaturalist is uh, it's a app and a website that's made by National Geographic and it's really, really popular. A lot of scientists are using it to do citizen science and to track where different, uh, different species are being found. So you would download that app and you would take a photo and you would upload it yeah. and then and professionals then, would yeah. look at it and give you an identification. First, it'll it sort of has like a plant recognition filter that will just make a guess. Sometimes it'll be a good guess. Sometimes it'll just be like, this is a plant or this is a tree if it's not sure. Um, but it'll at least put it into a category. And then within 24 hours or a couple of days, you'll start to see people identifying it. And it'll they'll narrow it down from whatever it sort of started as, which is really amazing. And then uh, with a lot of phones, smartphones now, if you take a photo, it'll give you an option to have some sort of like software AI sort of try to identify that. Otherwise, you can find a local gardener yeah. or there are gardening groups. Yeah. And there's different websites that will have perennial photos. Okay. So you've got a clump of something, uh, it's in your garden and you identify it as, you know, mm -hmm. say Black Eyed Susan, yeah. which is a perennial which ha goes by Rebecca. Rebecca, yeah, yeah. And you want to move that. Now, can you just take that and, and, and move it any time of the year? You, you can, especially something like Black Eyed Susan that's pretty hardy, but some of the perennials are a little bit more finicky. Um, spring is a really great time to do it because it still has a lot of time before it flowers. Uh, if you try and move it when the flower stalks are on or where the energy is of the plant is being put towards flowering, it's going to delay that flowering when you move it, or it might not flower at all. It might just give up. So right now, if you move it, 
you're basically going to put it in a new spot and the plant's going to spend some energy growing some new roots and getting established where it is. But then it's likely going to flower as usual. Yeah, the way I like to think of it is that like there's a balance between the top, the foliage of the plant and the root of the plant. And if you uh, cut back a lot of the, you know, roots, then uh, you have to cut back a certain amount of the top to balance it out again. Because if you, you know, if you move something, you break a lot of the roots and it's not going to have enough roots to sustain the top, you know. Yeah, that's a really great way to think about it. So with this time of year, most of these perennials don't have very much of a top. They just have roots. You're going to disturb the roots by moving it. So it's not really going to affect the top much because the top will grow to match how much roots that the plant now has. Exactly. And, I, and I'd say in that balance, like you can always err on the side of moving mostly roots and hardly any tops because that's where plants, you know, in a perennial plant, especially like that's where it lives when it dies back over the winter, the roots are there and that's all the plant that is left. And, you know, that's its, that's its life basically. So we got a plant, we've decided now, you, can you kind of divide all plants? Like, so if you have like a clump of Black-Eyed Susan is our example that we're using here, and you decide to dig it up this time of year because this is a good t time of year to do it, you've identified it. Now, can you just cut that into like, if it's a big clump, can you cut it into two, four, six pieces? Yeah, with a lot of plants, definitely you can cut them into pieces. You can either do it when it's in the ground, so you can take a sharp shovel, uh, or we have like a garden sort of machete and you can cut through it and then dig them up individually or you can just dig up a whole chunk and then cut it up once it's out of the ground. People do that for something like uh, hostas, which uh, are pretty hard to divide. They have like a pretty big, thick root mass. The, the big exception to that, though, is anything that has a taproot. So those are especially difficult to transplant. They don't like to be transplanted because their roots are, are sort of like long and deep. And some like examples would something. be, yeah, like a carrot, like a wild carrot or a lovage, which is like a type of uh, carrot family plant that has a taproot. And uh, there's a few perennials like... Um, like globe thistle. In those cases, you just have to be careful to get as much root as you can. And you can't really divide it up in the same way because even though there's going to be multiple tap roots in there, uh, you're going to want to try and be a little bit more gentle. And then again, like bulbs, you can't really divide bulbs. Like if it's a one bulb. like Or something like daylilies though. They have like a sort of bulbing system in the bottom. So if you uh, dig up a bunch of daylilies, you'll see all the daylily tubers that exist. Um, and you can split those apart, but you're not like cutting an individual tuber in half. You're just sort of making bunches of different tubers. Can you bear, like, is it better to like leave the soil around or like bare root it? Uh, it's, it's less stressful for the plant if you don't knock the soil off. The, the thing that's going to harm a plant when you're moving it around or transplanting it is that the roots are going to dry out and that's going to harm them and then they'll die back. And so you want, if you leave as much soil as possible on the roots, like you sort of pick it up like a big piece and then move it away, then that's going to be a little bit more effective than if all the soil falls off. In that case, you just have to really make sure that when you put it in a hole, you water it really well and you pack all the soil down around it. But not too well because you don't want to suffocate the yeah. roots. You don't want to drown the roots. For sure. You don't want to like smash it down, but you want to tamp it like. So roots need air. Yeah. And they get air out of the air pockets in the soil. So if you tamp down too hard, or if those air pockets are filled with water, then the plant roots drown and the plant dies. Right. But the water is going to drain away also. Yeah, in most situations. Yeah. But that's why you don't plant things in buckets without holes in them. Yeah, definitely. So, so a good question is, like, why would you move your perennials around? There's a couple different really good reasons. And one is if it's somewhere like in a really wet area, you know, you might have areas of your yard that end up being not very effective for gardening. Maybe they're dark, maybe they're really dry or windy, maybe they're really wet. So if you want to move things out of there after seeing how they did last year, that would be one reason to move them. Just give them a whole new location. So one thing, though, I just wanted to briefly touch upon, if you're moving things... If you're moving a clump of uh, roots that are from a perennial and you're keeping the dirt on there, you want to be careful though, right? You don't want to move things that you don't want to move with that plant. Yeah, it's true. So like you could have pests or invasives 
in that root ball. Yeah, that's a risk that you definitely take. And I've brought home plants from plant sales or plant swaps before. Often I end up with like a couple uh, little squill bulbs in there, which is one I don't mind, but you can also end up with uh, different kinds of pernicious weeds coming in those containers for sure. And also things like, you know, uh, pests that grow on the plant that maybe fall down into the soil that have like a multi-stage development. So they have a larva that's in the root ball and then that just, they're invisible. You move it along and then when it warms up, that turns into some sort of a caterpillar or a worm that crawls up and you don't really want to spread that around. No. And we also have issues with uh, like Japanese beetles and other um, fire ants, things like that. that If you're moving from parts of Nova Scotia to New Brunswick or vice versa, you might want to make sure you're not hauling an invasive with you. No, it's a good point. I mean, if you're moving things around in your yard, that's like one consideration. That's not a big deal. Although we do have an area of our yard, both at our home and in the culinary garden that has quite a bit of uh, bindweed in it. And I'm going to avoid transplanting things from that area into new areas. Although bindweed roots are quite big, so you can see them and pick them out to a certain extent. Um, But if you're moving things further than just around your yard, then you really do have to be careful, especially about pests. Like in Sackville, New Brunswick right now, we don't have those uh, Japanese beetles, the really big, gross ones that uh, I've heard stories of from as close as Oxford. So they're definitely like they're on their way. But I I don't want to deal with them. And I would think twice about digging something up in Halifax at this point if I thought that it could be transported here. So reasons you might want to move your perennials this time of year. One is because you can find a better location for them or maybe um, you want to divide them, uh, give half to your friends or divide them and propagate them throughout your garden if you're trying to like... If you have some black-eyed Susans and you want to divide them into two and have two clumps of black-eyed Susans, uh, you may have a situation where you have too many plants growing too close together. So uh, irises we had an issue with in the past growing too much, too close together, and they stopped flowering. And then you could also have issues with something like a rhubarb patch going into decline because it's too crowded. The same thing happens with Jerusalem artichokes. If they grow too close together, then they grow small artichokes instead of larger artichokes. For sure. Everything needs space to grow underground. And if you have an uh, older garden where things have been growing for a long time, they can decline. And perennials even will die. A lot of plants do have a lifespan. It's not like they are going to last forever. Uh, But definitely moving them can rejuvenate them. So digging up a clump of rhubarb, uh, dividing it up into pieces, and then putting it into new spots in your garden, potting it up, maybe giving it to some different people, um, and giving it into a nice bed that has a lot of compost and organic matter in it, that's going to start your bed anew. Like the roots are still there and they still have the potential to grow. They're just they're just not finding what they need in the soil anymore. So if you were to dig up, say half your, say you had a fairly large rhubarb patch and you were to dig half of those up and then the holes that you, you have behind, if you were to fill that in with like some nice compost yeah. and mulch it and stuff like that, then you would anticipate that your rhubarb would do better. Definitely. Yeah. And a lot of perennials need that. There's something like a uh, yarrow is one that we grow and it will form a bigger and bigger, bigger clump every year, but then the inside of the clump will start to die back. So that just sort of like looks weird and ugly. So in that case, you know, you want to take pieces from around the edge and spread them out and sort of let them clump again. So everything has its sort of growth patterns and yeah, it's about, about keeping things healthy. And this is also a good time of year to think about moving trees, if as long as they're small enough to move. Say you planted a tree uh, and you didn't get it in the right spot or it's not doing well where it is, you could think about uh, moving that tree. So a couple of tips when moving trees is, and we've learned this through uh, trial and error, is uh, oftentimes when we move a tree or we plant a tree, we go deep and we don't go very wide with the hole that we or the root mass that we want to move but uh, generally you want to go three times wider than you go deep Um, so you don't need to plant that root ball deep you want to give it lots of tilled up soil around it you want to try to dig out as wide around the tree as you can Mm -hmm. and then you want to plant the tree so that the 
collar, the root collar, where the tree meets the ground, where it flares out, that needs to be above the ground. Uh, if that's below the ground, then the roots are going to be too deep and that tree is not going to flourish the way it could. It might die or it just might never really do anything. Yeah, we've did, done that a couple of times, especially in situations where we were sort of sheet mulching areas. So we were building up organic matter around the trees and that root flare just got buried and it started to rot out and the trees really suffered. So yeah, in the industry, it's called volcano mulching and you've seen it. You walk around a garden and you see where uh, there's a huge pile of mulch around the tree and it looks like a little volcano like Mount Fuji or something like that and the little tree is sticking out from it that's not good you want to clear that away and you want that to be totally level and it comes back to what you were saying about uh, roots actually breathing and needing air as well as water so like they're getting that air exchange through the surface of the soil and through the base of the tree yeah and there's also another issue that you run into with fruit trees is that we like you trees do not want grass growing right up to the trunk uh, you need to dig uh, like you need to dig an area around the trunk of bare land where you mulch but mulch flat don't mulch volcano mulch and that should be the drip line of the tree so if you look at the however wide the trees branches go out the drip line is where that water would fall off the branches at the outermost extreme of the tree and it should be dirt and mulched that entire way it's not possible if you have a giant linden tree in your backyard mm -hmm. to take up all your lawn if you did that but the more the the happier the tree is going to be and you don't have to have that just be dead area like you can plant other things in there but not grass so you have that root collar and what happens is if you over mulch it or if there's grass right up to it, it can tend to get wet and infected and die. And then the tree's cambrium doesn't work properly and the whole tree dies. Uh, you'll notice that you'll see damage and whippersnipper damage is another problem that we run into when we have grass growing right up to the trunk. We have a tendency or someone might come along with a whippersnipper and chew up the bark, which is very problematic. So those are some things that we want to avoid when we're moving and planting um, shrub, like small trees. Yeah. Yeah. And moving and planting small shrubs right now is also a really great thing to do. I love growing like small fruit shrubs like uh, gooseberries and currants. And uh, they're just really great shrubs that look good all year, produce fruit. And also uh, they can go in all kinds of different areas. They don't need like a full sun garden um, and they propagate really easily. So uh, we ended up with like five different gooseberry bushes by moving a gooseberry bush because everywhere where a gooseberry branch touches the ground, it would start to root. And so I just detached those and then uh, potted them up. And you can do that on purpose too, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. I mean, I sort of halfway did it on purpose and left so those. So you would take a, a branch... Mm -hmm. And, and you pin it to the ground and then where it's touching, it will just start to root in the ground on the stem. So those are advantageous roots that call that grow. And then you just snip that branch off. Yeah. And you move that whole thing into a container and then it's its own gooseberry. Exactly. What are some other plants you could do that with? Uh, sage and lavender also do that really, really effectively. And grapes, I suppose. Yeah, grapes do too. So yeah, lots of different ones in terms of shrubs. So it's good to leave them attached for sort of like a full growing season so that the piece can get established. But, but after that, uh, you can move them. And, and one thing I learned about um, also moving shrubs is just like with trees where there's a tendency to dig a really giant hole and fill it with really, really rich material. When you're moving something like a gooseberry shrub that's, you know, a pretty low maintenance bush, you don't necessarily want to give it a huge ton of fertility at that point. A bit of bone meal in the hole is totally fine. Uh, if you packed in too much compost, it might actually over fertilize the plant and then it might actually have a harder time because it would be focusing on growing green instead of focusing on that root growth. Yeah, I've also uh, come across the idea that if you fertilize right where you plant the tree, then the roots don't have any incentive to spread out. Right, also uh, true, yeah. So you want those roots to spread out and get into the soil, uh, the established soil, not just the little ball that you planted which is like another problem that can happen if you are planting 
like skinny, tall fruit trees. We had this with an apple tree uh, at our house where uh, it gets something called wind rock, where the tree will be in the wind here. It's really windy uh, all the time and the tree will rock back and forth in the wind and it'll continually move the roots and the roots uh, will have a hard time establishing themselves in the soil around the area and becoming more stable. So if you have a tree that you notice and, and you'll notice a root or a, a wind rocking tree, um, it'll be a tree that's not doing very well and you can't really figure out why, but if you look at where the trunk goes into the ground, you'll see there's sort of a hole has developed where it's constantly moving and rocking in that little hole around the trunk and that's a sign of it and in order to fix that you want to stake that tree off. Another trick that uh, we had in a similar situation is when you accidentally plant a tree too deep uh, and the tree is just not doing much. It's hardly growing at all. Just a little tiny bit every year. We had this problem with the ginkgo tree. It's because we buried it too deep and, and we yeah. weren't aware of that at the time. Uh, so what we did is we just sort of like went around the tree and mulched around it uh, quite wide and then kind of got under the tree and sort of propped it up with a lever and then put some material under it so that what we're doing is we're just kind of jacking that tree up and usually you don't bury trees too deep. It right. could just, even two or three inches can make a huge difference. So we jacked that tree up about three inches and cleared around the root collar. And the next year it did great. And then the following year it did better, which reminds me of like this saying um, that you mentioned to me, which is uh, when you move a perennial. So the first year you plant a perennial that you got from a friend or the garden center, it really just sleeps. It's just going to sit there. It'll probably flower and grow a little bit, but it's not going to get any bigger. And then the second year, it's going to start to creep. So it's going to grow a little bit. It's going to move into its surrounding environment. But then the third year, it's going to leap. So in that case, you may find self-seeded pieces that have grown up in other parts of your garden, but also the original plant is going to be a lot bigger. And some plants will just take off at that point, but it takes a few years for them to really get established in that area. So if you do plant new perennials, new shrubs, new trees, yeah. and they're not doing very well, at least give it three years unless there's an obvious problem that you can figure out. Yeah. Like give it three years to sort of figure out because it takes the plant a while to establish and, and, and get used to its environment. And it takes a while for you to figure it out. Like another reason that I move perennials around in the spring is because I will collect them sort of throughout the spring early spring and the fall, and then I'll plant them in what I call a nursery bed. So it's somewhere that I can plant perennials. A and junk drawer? A ner like a plant it, junk drawer? Yeah. it's. I, I had a friend related to being a junk drawer. So you sort of stick everything in this area and then see what it does. And, you know, maybe that's a good way to keep an eye out for any kinds of weeds that came in with the uh, plant if you got it from someone else, or just to figure out if it likes the environment it's in, what it looks like when it flowers, how tall it is you can't really tell especially if you get it from a plant sale um, but even a plant tag they're all different uh, and then after a year or two in this location you can sort of say okay well this one actually would look really good with this other plant over here and you can think more consciously about the design of your garden and where you want things to go with all this information about like best practices for moving things around it it, it becomes obvious that the time of year we tend to do the most purchasing and planting of perennial shrubs and fruit trees is not the ideal time. So the home centers put out their garden centers usually around the May long weekend and then you get around to going and you, you get the fruit tree and you are going to try to plant that fruit tree sometime in June, maybe even as late as July, but that's not ideal. No, I mean, now is a really great time because a lot of things have hardly grown. Uh, they're just getting going. I mean, some plants like milkweed hasn't even emerged yet. Like if you have a milkweed patch, it takes it quite a while for it to start. And why would I want to have a milkweed patch? Because they're beautiful and because they attract uh, monarch butterflies. Right. So that's the staple food and breeding area exactly, for, monarchs. for monarchs. Yeah. And the reason we don't have as many monarchs as we used to have is because we don't have as many milkweed plants because we've taken those milkweed plants and we've cut them down and replaced them with grass. Yeah, just because of the loss of habitat in general around. 
and also because of pesticides. Things are up just enough that you can recognize them. Exactly. Yeah. And and I mean, some people thought that a plant sale happening at the beginning of May was a little bit early because I think a lot of people haven't really got into the garden yet. They'll sort of wait until there's really, really warm days before they get at it and wait till things are very much like grown and established and larger. But, uh, you know, one trick is when you go to the garden center and things are in bloom, especially if they're perennials, like that's not good. You want to you want to buy them when they're not in bloom, put them in your garden and allow them to bloom there. That's going to be a lot healthier for the plant. So waiting until the end of June, beginning of July. Yeah, no, it's not ideal. Also, the conditions are pretty harsh at that point. Like starting in the beginning of July, we get a lot of like hot, hot, hot weather. And it's way better for a perennial plant that's been alive all winter and is slowly coming out in the spring to uh, just acclimatize to a new home in this kind of conditions. It's usually wetter in the spring as well, which is really great. So, which brings us to the concept of healing something in. So, if you were to go at the end of the season, say July and August, maybe September, to a plant uh, center and you found a tree that you really want, uh, take it to an area that's sort of shady and wet in your yard and cover the bucket of the tree with mulch and just leave it there until the leaves fall off in the fall and then plant it before the winter starts is a better idea than planting it right away. You're gonna have much better success if you heal that in and just sort of keep it in stasis until the leaves fall off the trees, it gets a little colder, gets fall dampness, then you wanna plant it and it'll just stay dormant and it'll be planted, at ex it'll come alive exactly at the right time in the spring to have a full year. Yeah, if you think about a lot of these plants live in containers for a few years as they're getting established and growing another summer isn't going to harm it because you're going to plant it in the winter you're listening to the culinary garden show we can be heard on chma 106.9 in sackville new brunswick ckdu 88.1 fm in halifax nova scotia on apple podcasts and you can see a video version of this on youtube at culinary garden and if you want to get in touch with us you can send an email Culinary Kitchen Garden at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Toodly do.